main difference between the Quran and the previous three divine complete books is that those books were received by prophets in a very short time. He raises his hands and he says, Ya Allah, keep me on the pattern of my friend Abu Bakr and my prophet Muhammad Wasallam. But Ya Allah, grant abundance, prosperity to the ummah of the prophet of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al kareem amma ba'd. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Qala Allahu ta'ala fi al furqan al hamid. Amana al rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. Kullun amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير. The verse I recited is from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number two eight five, in which Allah Almighty makes mention of the articles of faith. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah Almighty. Last lesson we started to speak about the books of Allah known as Wakutubi Wakutubi the books of Allah Almighty we made mention that uh, Allah Almighty at no time has left humanity without guidance and if for some reason humanity is left without guidance then the Hisab Kitab, the reckoning, will be very, very difficult. As Allah Almighty makes mention in Surah number 17, verse number 15, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah will not punish a person, a group, a nation, if that individual, that group, that nation was not visited by a prophet. The Prophet has to come, deliver the message, and then it is up to the community to accept or reject. So if anyone did not pass through that, then the rule may change. As we made mention that in Imam Bahki's Shu'bul Iman, there are a hadith indicating that there will be certain people that will be given the opportunity to accept and reject on the day of judgment. So most probably it is those people that did not receive a prophet, that were not visited by prophets. Then we made mention that uh, prophets in the past, many received complete books, commandments that were so many that formed a book. And then there were other prophets that received something very brief that was printed on a stone, uh, inscribed on a stone or on a tablet. And this is known as suhuf, scriptures. Something very, very brief, not detailed. Allah Almighty makes mention of the suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa in Surah Al-A'la. Surah Al-A'la is Surah number 87, the surah that many, many imams throughout the world recite for Salatul Jumu'ah. We're going to speak about those suhuf and the content of those suhuf, those scriptures. We further made mention that the four complete books that were given to Anbiya, they are the Quran, the Torah, the Injil, and the Zabur. I make mention of them in order, in terms of status. Quran, given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Torah, given to Prophet Musa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, Injil, given to Prophet Isa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, and Zabur, given to Prophet Dawood Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. The main difference between these four books, let's put the Quran on one side and the three books on one side, one of the main difference is that these books were not final. 
there were commandments that came after these books as well. The Quran is the final book, meaning the final message of Allah Almighty. There is no message that will come after the Quran. That is our belief. Meaning that the person that received this final book known as the Quran is the final messenger. That's number one. The number two main difference between the Quran and the previous three divine complete books is that those books were received by prophets in a very short time. Very short time. We gave a reference last week, Surah A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 142, that Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu was salam received the entire Torah in 40 nights. The Quran was given to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bit by bit, and the journey of the Quran is over 23 long years. We may mention the reason why that the Prophet of Allah had ample time to receive and to relate and to educate. By the time the Quran was completed in revelation, in descending, there was a very large group of Sahaba that knew the entire Quran off by heart from cover to cover, number one. And number two, there was a very large group of scholars. There were 140 muftis. 140 muftis amongst the Sahaba that Prophet Muhammad Sassim left behind. 140, remember that. And amongst them, there were 14 great muftis, like Hazrat Abdullah ibn Masood, Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala an, anha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So there were many, many scholars that were given education pertaining to the scripture, to the Quran. All right, now. <coughs> Now we're going to speak about the suhuf today. Suhuf is very, very important. All right, we're going to speak about the content of the suhuf. Scholars of this are of this understanding that Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu was salam, he received 10 sahifas. Now sahifa is like maybe a brochure, one paper on which there are certain commands. So Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu was salam, he received 10 papers. Suhuf, scriptures, not very detailed, very, very brief. Um, has a sheath, the son of Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu was salam, according to scholarship, he received about 50 sahifas. 50 sahifas. By the time has a sheath alayhi salatu was salam received the sahifa, the crime of murder had been committed. Qabil had murdered Habib. As the Shis came after that, he received 50 sahifas. 30 sahifas were given to Hazrat Idris alayhi salatu was salam. The Prophet Hazrat Idris alayhi salatu was salam, who has been made mention by name in the glorious Quran. And between 10 to 30 sahifas were given to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. So there are many, many Prophets that have received sahifas, scriptures. You could say that commandments that are not too many that you can make a book but you can make a pamphlet all right now as i promised last week that we are going to make mention of the content of the suhuf of ibrahim and musa so we know what allah spoke of to nations in the past now the principal verse as a reference i would like you to remember is from surah al-a'la and that is Surah number 87. And when you go back home, study from verse number 14. But when you get to the climax, the climax is the last two verses, verse 18 and 19. Inna hadha lafis suhuf al-ula, suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa. Verily, this is in the former scripture. What is? We'll speak about that later on. And the scripture of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and Musa. Now, I just made mention that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, received the entire book known as the Torah. So, what suhuf is Allah referring to? So, scholars have two opinions. That before receiving the Torah, Hazrat Musa was given a sahifa. So, before receiving the detailed commandment, constitution, 
as a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam received a scripture that was very very brief right and this opinion makes sense and then after that on the request of the community bani israil as a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam went to the mountain and received the detailed constitution that is known as the Torah. Now, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari, radiyallahu ta'ala an, he inquired from the Prophet of Allah. Now, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari is a very unique Sahabi. Remember that he's a very unique Sahabi. The quality that he has, you will not find in the Sahaba. This is unique to Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari. He took the personal choices of the Nabi of Allah and he inculcated them and I'll make mention of what that means and then he tried to impose them on others as well. For example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he wore clothes that had patches he kept away from food for many many days he opted destitution over prosperity Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari radiyallahu ta'ala took that practice so when Islam started to spread and wealth came to Madinatul Munawwara in the form of booty mal ghanimat and sahaba became prosperous and rich their lifestyle changed their dwellings changed the clothing changed, the food on the table changed. Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari did not change. Because he was a early Sahabi, he accepted Islam in Mecca. He was a Muhajir and he was old, so everyone respected him. So he used to go into homes and see people eating lavish food. He used to reprimand them and give them a mouthful. Now people couldn't respond because of respect. So they took the complaint to the Khalifa, Hazrat Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala. So Hazrat Usman Ghani summoned Abu Zar Ghifari and said, Look, the way that you want to live is not accepted by the message. So it is time for you to leave Madinatul Munawwara and live outside. So in the time of Hazrat Usman Ghani, this great Sahabi, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari, according to the prophecy of the Prophet of Allah, he left Madinatul Munawwar. And he lived on the outskirts. That's why they say that the characteristic of Jesus, peace be upon him, if you were to search for that characteristic in one Sahabi, it is Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari. The Zuhd, abstaining from worldly pleasures. Hazrat Isa wasalam, was known for this. The Sahabi that emulates Hazrat Isa, Jesus peace be upon him, is Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala. That's why there are certain things that are not a part of the constitution, but the Prophet of Allah practiced them. I'll draw your attention to that by this example. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, one day he invited a Sahabi for lunch. He said, come to my house and have lunch with me. So the Sahabi arrived late. Hazrat Umar, who was the Khalif, he said that, I was waiting for you, you are late, let's have lunch. The Sahabi says, I have had my lunch. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, I was waiting for you. I told you we're going to have lunch together. Why did you delay the meeting? And then in addition, you've had your lunch. So he put his head down in a manner that he was hiding something. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, speak out. Why? He said, Hazrat, what you eat, I can't digest. What you eat, I cannot digest. You put bread in water huh? and then you eat that. This is something that we don't like, I don't like and I can't digest it. Now, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, the Khalif, he didn't say you have to eat it. Because the constitution says you can eat anything that is halal and pure. You can have biryani, 
You can have butter chicken. You don't have to have bread in the water. So the Sharia allows us to eat anything. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he saw the Prophet of Allah. His personal choice. And he was taken that personal choice of the Prophet of Allah. So he did not go for biryani, for butter chicken, for korma. He didn't go for that. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and this is the wisdom, this is the compassion of these people for humanity. He raised his hands. And I'd like you to remember this. Never ever impose your piety upon somebody else. Remember that. Never do that. Your piety is for yourself. He raises his hands and he says, Ya Allah, keep me on the pattern of my friend Abu Bakr and my Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. But Ya Allah, grant abundance, prosperity to the ummah of the Prophet of Allah. So he's saying, Ya Allah, give these people a lot of food. But don't allow me to deviate from that path that I have seen my friend Abu Bakr practice and my Nabi practice. And that was a path of dry roti. <laughs> that was bread in the water. Now, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari is that Sahaba. One day, inshallah, we, we may make mention of the story of Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari, but I don't want to deviate from the content that we want to share today. So, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala, he says to the Prophet of Allah, what is the content of the scripts of Hazrat Ibrahim? We may mention Hazrat Ibrahim received suhuf, brief commandments. Made mention in Surat A'la. Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari is asking the Prophet of Allah, what were the commandments? What was the content that Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam received? The Holy Prophet ﷺ replied that they contained educating parables, amthali ibrat, eh? examples, parables by which you educate people. So examples by which you educate people. And then in the suhuf of Ibrahim, there's a story told, and I'm going to say it in my own words, or I'm not going to read from the book. There's a story told that they, Allah addresses a king. Now, most probably this king is Namrud. Most probably the king is Namrud. Now, you all know who Namrud is. You all know who Namrud is. Namrud is the king in the time of Ibrahim who is responsible for lighting the fire and throwing Ibrahim into the fire. The same king that Hazrat Ibrahim has a debate with. أَلَمْ تُرَى إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكِ 257 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah Almighty speaks about the debate, the rebuttal between Ibrahim and Namrud. And then Namrud is the same person that uh, died because of the entry of a mosquito through the nostrils. Uh, that started eating the brain of this king. Right? So that is a story. So most probably it is Namrud. So in the Suhuf of Ibrahim, there's a story that Allah Almighty says to a certain king without stipulating the name, but we are reading between the lines, most probably it is Namrud, that you haughty, eh? you arrogant, you naughty king, we have not given you power so you can amass wealth. Allah is saying to the king, we have not given you power so you can amass wealth and become wealthier and become more powerful, but we have given you authority and wealth so the dua of an oppressed person does not reach me. So the dua of an oppressed person does not reach me. Meaning that if anyone is being wrong done in your domain, in your country, he should be able to come to you and freely speak and then you serve justice. Don't allow the dua of a oppressed person to come to me. Because if that dua does come to me of an oppressed person, it doesn't matter if the dua is of a Muslim or a non-Muslim, I will respond. What is happening in the world right now? 
I have made mention of this before. This was something that, and, and this is in line with Sharia, with Islam. Because Prophet Muhammad says, when an oppressed person, the Arabic word is mazloom, when an oppressed person makes dua and he says, Ya Allah, this wrongdoer, this zalim has wrongdone me. Ya Allah, you take the matters in your hands. Serve justice. According to the scripture of Ibrahim, and according to the teachers of Prophet Muhammad Allah will respond. Why isn't Allah responding right now? Why? Think about it. People in Pakistan, why? People in India, why? People in the world, why? Us, you know, we are Muslim. Many, many people are wrong, done. Why isn't Allah Almighty responding? Now, to truly and completely know, we don't know. Only Allah knows. But if we study, we contemplate, we dissect the matter, we come to this understanding that every mazloom at a certain place in his life is a zalim. Every wrongdoer, every, sorry, every wrong done person is a wrongdoer as well. So every person in general is carrying two titles. He's mazloom, but he's zalim. He's mazloom, but he's zalim. I'll give you an example. One person, he is robbed by a person that has more authority than him. So today, I am robbed by a person that has more authority than me. So I am mazloom, he's zalim. The following day, I rob somebody who is lesser than me. So now I become zalim. So I am zalim to the person lesser than me. But I am mazloom to the person that is higher than me. Every person is carrying two titles. And because of this, dua does not reach the court of Allah Almighty. If we want our duas to reach the court of Allah Almighty, we need to free ourselves from wrongdoing. And if we can, because they say, जिसके पास सौ रुपए है वो सौ रुपए की चोरी करेगा जिसके पास इतनी ताकत है दो सौ रुपए दो सौ रुपए इस ए सेइंग इन आवर कंट्री इफ ही हैज़ द एबिलिटी टू स्टील अ थाउजेंड ही विल स्टील अ थाउजेंड यू नो वी लुक एट दिस लीडर्स एंड दिस पॉलिटिशियंस एंड वी सेइंग दे रॉबिंग बिलियंस मोस्ट we can deceive somebody for $200, we do it. Our limitations is $200 a car. Then they come to the Imam, they say, Imam Sahib, is it okay? What? <laughs> There's certain things you don't ask the Imam. You, you know it is wrong. They say, Imam Sahib, we, and they come up with these amazing, you know, amazing. They say, Imam Sahib, I've told him this car, look at it, it's up to you. You accept it, you reject it. They don't make mention of the faults. They said, it's for you to find it. Imam Sahib, is this okay? <laughs> now, this person, his whole world, in terms of profit, is in that car. But is he truthful in selling that car? He will lie for two, three hundred dollars extra. Now, if this same person can get a contract from the government, where he can make two, three million, he will not hesitate. And I'm speaking about myself, we're all the same. And that's why the person that is mazloom, he carries the same title after a few moments as a dhalim. All right. So this was the first educating parable in Suhufi Ibrahim. Further. <coughs> the next one is very important. I find tremendous benefit in this. And it's, I will title it Time Management. This parable in Suhufi Ibrahim is time management. Time, they say nowadays, is money. Time is money. And Allah Almighty starts off one of the most, uh, most complete surahs in terms of guidance known as Surah Al Asr. Time. Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, he makes mention 
that if Allah did not send down 113 surahs and only sent down one surah, wala as inna li insan la fi khus illa aladina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr. This one surah is sufficient for guidance. Imam Shafi rahmatullah alayhi says that. He says, I can extract sufficient rulings from this one short surah that will be sufficient for guidance. And it starts with time. And Allah Almighty takes an oath of time. Asr. Allah swears by time. So time management is very, very important. You look at our predecessors, people that did so much, they did it in the same 24 hours. The same 24 hours that we're living. Time has never changed. It's always been 24 hours. Never 25, no, never 26. Days 12 hours, nights 12 hours. And they used to live for 60 or 70 years. Exactly the same. We have the same time. But they used to be very, very stingy pertaining to time. Just like we are stingy in using our money. We spend our money, we count it. We count it. We recount it. Likewise, they used to count the time that passed by. That what did I fill that time with? So this parable, this mithal in Suhuf Ibrahim is about time management. And Hazrat Abu Dhar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala is told by the Prophet of Allah that Allah Almighty says one part so divide your time into three portions. One part should be reserved for the worship of his Lord and dua. Because our purpose in life, our purpose in life is the worship of Allah Almighty. As Allah Almighty makes mention in surah number 51, verse number 56, wal insa illa liyabudu. We have created the humans and the jinns for the worship. So, first thing is there should be a time in your day, in your night, in your 24 hours that is designated for worship and for supplication. That is the first. Number two. The second part of time should be for self-assessment and reflection on the world in which you are. Two things. Self-assessment. Hasabu qabla an tuhasabu. Very strong statement of Prophet Muhammad Take account of yourself before Allah takes your account. Because one day Allah is going to take an account. So take an account before Allah takes an account. So the suhuf of Ibrahim, the second time management slot is take an account of your deeds. And then addition to that, Look at the place in which you are and look at the surroundings and in that find the Creator. As Allah Almighty says, in the samawati wal ard wa layli wal nahar la ayatil li ulil albab surah number 3 verse 190. That look at how Allah has created the heavens and the earth and the alteration of day and night. There are signs in this for la ayatil li ulil bab for the people of wisdom. So the second time management slot is self-assessment and studying the environment in which you are to find Allah Almighty. And the third is acquisition of livelihood. That you go and find your food and put it on the table. So what is the time management that was given to us at Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? Number one, and this is the most important, Worship and dua. Worship and dua. And they have separated worship from dua. And dua is a worship as well. But sometimes we don't make dua. Reading Quran, praying, that's fine. But dua is very, very important. Prophet Muhammad Sallam says, A dua, mukhul ibadah. Dua, supplication, is the essence of worship. Let me share with you something here. When you are driving, I've made mention of this before. Speak, start speaking with Allah. Start speaking with Allah without even raising your hand. Don't go into these formalities. Of course, we sit down and make dua. But when you're driving, you say Allah and you start speaking to Him. 
take Allah as your friend. Speak to Him. And I want you to remember the word, invisible friend. How many parents have come across their children having an invisible friend? Some children here, they say we have an invisible friend. There he is. The mom says, where? Imagination. Children have an imagination. They make these invisible friends. Make Allah your invisible friend. Talk to him. Let people see that you are talking and there's no one in front of you. Let them call you a mad person. All right? Very, very important. Supplication. Number two. Look at the environment in which you are, all right, and find Allah Almighty and do a self-assessment. Every day before going to sleep, look at where you are in terms of your deen, in terms of your creator, in terms of the people around you. Have I done the right thing? And number three, time management. Go out and find your sustenance. As Allah Almighty says in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, Surah number 62, right at the end, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ when you have completed your Jumu'ah prayer, because in the past, Bani Israel, for the whole day, Saturday, they could not go out for livelihood. From Maghrib to Maghrib, they could not go out to collect their sustenance. Allah Almighty says in the Quran that after Jumu'ah, it is still Jumu'ah, go out. Fantashiru, spread on the earth. And search for the grace of Allah Almighty, meaning your livelihood. All right. Next part is amazing. And this should allow us to rethink, many of us. But many of us become redundant in terms of where we are. Allah says to us that Ibrahim والسلام, in Suhufi Ibrahim, be well acquainted. With the time in which you are. Apne mohol se waqif raho. Very, very important. The environment in which you are, you should know about it. Sometimes we sit in the masjid, we don't know what's going on. We need to know what is going on. Because if we don't know what is going on with our children, with our children, we don't know what's going on. How can we diagnose the problem? How are we going to educate them? So in the Suhuf of Ibrahim, be well acquainted. Know the environment in which you are. Know the environment in which you are sending your children. Know what they're thinking. Know the trend of the time. You need to know the trend of the time. If I'm sitting and I'm speaking about a topic that is not relevant to the people, it's not going to register. It's going to be of no benefit. Now, if people are taking drugs and I'm not speaking about drugs and the harms of drugs, I am not well acquainted with the issues of the time. I need to master myself with the problems that people are facing. You need to, as a parent, master yourself with the problems that your children are facing. The problems in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Muslim country may be a bit different compared to the problems that we are facing in this country. We know LGBT, this is a problem of this country. We need to be well acquainted. We need to have the ammunition, the tools, the education, the knowing of everything that surrounds us. We can't just sit in the mosque and close our eyes. The example Mulana Jalaluddin Rumi says is, the, the chicken is cornered by the cat. And what does the chicken do? Close its eyes. And it feels secure because it can't see the cat. But the cat is still there. Once the chicken opens the eye, the cat is still there, ready to pounce, ready to eat, ready to kill. We can close our eyes from the issues around us, but that does not divert the issue. The issues are knocking on our door. Remember that all the parents, all of us, these issues are knocking on our door. The problems that people come with to me now are very, very different than the problems that they come with that they used to come with 10 years ago. Very, very different. We need to evolve. Humanity is evolving in sin. 
we need to evolve as well with the diagnosis, with the remedies, with the methods of obliterating, eliminating, removing these sicknesses. Yeah? And this is a nasiha given in the suhuf of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Right at the end, uh, Hazrat Abu Zargifari says that the Prophet of Allah said that be very, very mindful. In the suhuf of Ibrahim, it speaks about the tongue. This is amazing. Speaks about the tongue. Speaks about the tongue. That take the tongue as a body part that you are going to use as duty. When I when I read this, I was a bit confused. I said, What what do you mean by duty? When a person does something as a duty, he takes responsibility. So I know my duty, you know your duty. You need to work from eight to five. This is your duty. There are certain rules pertaining to your duty. There are certain things that you do. While the duty, there's a responsibility on your shoulder. When it comes to the tongue, take it as a duty. Because if you take your articulator, your wo words as a duty, that I have a responsibility, you will use the artic articulator less. You will be mindful with your words. And that's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once, a Sahabi came and he said, Ya Rasul, can anyone be thrown in the fire of hell, or can anyone be reprimanded, responsible for the words that he utters? And Prophet Muhammad said, you're talking about responsibility. There are going to be many, many people that are going to be flipped upside down and they're going to be thrown into the fire of hell head first because of the misusage of the tongue. So we can't allow this tongue to be too loose. Head first, thrown into the fire of hell because of the articulator. All right. Then Hazrat Abu Zarqifari radiallahu ta'ala and he inquired about the suhuf, what we spoke about in the suhuf of Ibrahim. Then Hazrat Abu Zarqifari in the same majlis, he says, Ya Rasulullah, the Quran, verse number 13 and 14 of surah number 87, says suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa. So what was in the scriptures of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, what I'm going to share with you, this is the essence of the soul. It is the essence of the soul. Internal purification. So what Musa alayhi salatu wasalam received before the Torah, known as the suhuf of Musa, not the Torah, suhuf of Musa, it was basically Allowing them to open their eyes that have become blind because of the veils of materialism. And this is known as the sawwuf, tazkiyah, internal purification. I'm going to share one or two with you. Allah Almighty says, I am surprised. I am surprised. And I would like you to listen to these words and place yourself as the addressee of these words. That Allah is addressing you. I am surprised that the person who believes that he will certainly die, and yet he is living happily. It's amazing. One person, he knows he's going to die. But he can still live happily. He can have ambitions pertaining to this dunya. You know, Allah Almighty, it's amazing in the Quran. Yaqeen, the word yaqeen, means conviction. And yaqeen is not susceptible to doubt. Yaqeen means final. No doubt in it. I would like you to go and open the Quran to verse number 99 of surah number 15, surah Hijr. Allah Almighty says, Wa'bud Rabbaka hatta ya'tiyakal yaqeen. Worship your Lord until comes to you yaqeen. Allah didn't say ya'tiyakal maut. He used the word yaqeen because yaqeen means no doubt. Meaning, maut has no doubt. It's going to come to all of us. But uh, it's amazing. Allah has made this world so glamorous, so attractive, and then has placed certain chips in us that have that attraction towards that glamour, that blind us, and we forget about yaqeen, maut, and we engage in this worldly rat race and forget about the preparation of death. So Allah Almighty says, I'm surprised. I am absolutely surprised with a human being who knows that he's going to die 
But still, he is very, very happy with the ambitions that he has pertaining to this world. And he's living happily. <laughs> it's very, very surprising. The person that is in jail. He knows tomorrow he's going to be executed. Or let's say he knows he's going to be executed in the next one week. It's amazing in, in movies they show that one night before they say, what, what meal would you like? The best meal. What do you think he's going to eat one night before he's going to be executed? But in the movies, the show, he said, I want steak. I want potatoes. I want gravy. Well, Allah, they don't enjoy it. They're not going to enjoy it. When you know with absolute certainty that tomorrow is my last day, uh, the gravy, the steak doesn't interest a person. That's the same thing that the Prophet of Allah is being educating his people with. So the suhuf of Musa is that you know that you're going to go and this person in jail, in the cell, he knows he's going to go tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to go tomorrow. You may go now. It's even worse scenario. You may go now. We just buried a person two days ago at Holland Park Cemetery, 46 years old. And he is buried beside Chacha Ibrahim who died at 94. Chacha Ibrahim, the Muslim of Karabi, the Muslim of uh, Slacks Creek Masjid. He's at 94. He died at 94. The person, one day after him, he's buried beside him, 46. Half his age. It's ajeeb. These are ibrats, these are parables, these are missiles for us. But still we are happy with the life that we are living. So Allah Almighty is saying in the suhuf of Musa, wake up. We're going to stop at that. We're going to continue with these parables. And then inshallah we're going to make mention of a few beautiful, rich statements of Nabi Akrim Muhammad to compare with Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa. In a nutshell, what we have studied today, that uh, Azad Abu Zargifari radiallahu ta'ala, he asked the Prophet of Allah, what is the content or a few pieces of advice that we can find in the Suhuf of Ibrahim, the scriptures of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah Almighty makes mention of a king, most probably the king known as Namrud. That Allah has not given you wealth and power and status. So you can become wealthier, more mightier. But Allah has given you all this power. All this power. So the oppressed person does not come to me. He comes to you and you deliver justice. Then uh, Allah Almighty makes mention of uh, time management. Right? So one part of your time should be for worship and supplication. Second, time management should be for self-assessment and um, reflection on the omnipotence of Allah Almighty. So you look at the realm in which you are and try to study it and try to find Allah Almighty in His creation. Because we say about Allah Almighty, everything that we see is a result of the, remember the word, creative hand. Everything that you see is a result of the creative hand. And once you understand the creative hand, it should turn you to the creator. And then the third one is acquisition of livelihood. You find your livelihood. Then it was about the tongue. Remember the tongue? That take the tongue as a duty. So you are very, very mindful how you use this tongue. Then the suhuf of um, um, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, we only mentioned one, that I am surprised that that person who basically believes that he will die, but still he is living a life that is not conducive to the preparation of death aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lis sa'iril muslimin fastaghfiru innahu huwal ghafurur rahim